I remember moving and going back to my grandparents' farm to live. We went back on the train. We were on the train a week. It was a long trip. My grandparents were living on their farm home in Michigan. The rest of this reading, we're looking at the farm photo that we're going to talk about. Mildred held the framed photo lovingly as she talked. That's my grandmother in white. She always wore light things. They would always be starched and ironed. I was five years old when we went back to the farm. I loved the farm. You couldn't help but love the farm. It's everything that people love. You can see the horses and the cattle. My grandfather would be cross with me. He would say, you can't drive anything around here. She's got everything tamed. <laughs> now this is a hired man, and he was working down in the field. Over here is my Uncle Will. I always felt so proud of him. He worked very hard and became a lawyer in Yakima, Washington. These are wonderful horses and cows. They had excellent animals. The name of the farm was Riverview Farm. The river was the St. Mary's River. This is a very big river out front. It's very wide and deep. And there's all kinds of boats going in it. And you can look out at any time and see the boats going by. In the summertime, there are boats carrying passengers for fun times. <coughs> Otherwise, there are big boats carrying supplies. There were lots of boats on the river all, at all times. It's in the northern part of Michigan, on the border of Canada. The weather was very cold in the winter time. The river would freeze about this thick, two feet thick. We would buy, um, cut out chunks of it and store it. We had this building that had stored ice in it. I used to go out. You would hope that some of the, the some of it would get ice on it to skate on. If the sun came out and melted, then froze, I could skate on it. No place to go sledding, though. This land is left. Now, I understand the house today looks just like that. The inside of it was lovely. It had four big bedrooms upstairs. Looking out this window, which was my bedroom, we could see the river. My grandmother was a great gardener. She loved flowers. And she had big beds of flowers all along the edge here. As told by Mildred Hubert. I knew that Jackie was a wonderful person right away. We became very close to each other. And then my mother met her. And she had the same feelings that I had for her, that she was a very wonderful person or a very wonderful girl. I didn't care which. <laughs> we had good feelings for each other and became very close. I had a car that I could use because Dad and Mom thought it was a good thing to do. And for some reason, my dad told me that I was a good driver. <laughs> he helped the drivers, and then he also drove those who were classified. And that was good, because my father was a very cautious person. Well, it didn't take long to be sure that she was the kind of girl that I wanted to marry. My cousin Cornelius performed the marriage. He was one of the best persons that I ever knew. 
Our honeymoon? Oh. The cabin. Yes, the cabin. That would have been our first choice. As told by Morgan West. I was born and raised on a cattle sheep ranch in Montana. My grandfather started it, my father continued it, and now his son is continuing it. Then the fourth generation, now the girls are running the ranch. It was a big job. The sheep have to be transported from the mountain down up into another valley, and that was a big thing to do to herd all the sheep. My grandfather or father would go once a week and check on the herd. We went along. We were very much a part of it. I had to help my mother. She died when I was 14. By that time, I was away at school. She had her fourth child and died in childbirth. It came faster than her other kids. The rest of us were born in very sanitary conditions. She went to a small town and got an infection. I still remember my father coming home. He came across the river in his car. He stopped, put his head down on the steering wheel, and I knew something was wrong. I was going to school. I went to grade school, and then went away for two years in high school. But as a child, I had a lot to do with my family. I went away to high school because the nearest high school was 40 miles away. My mother found a family for me to live with, and they were good families and had kids my age in school. She sort of set up my social life for me. That's just how it had to be. I went to Minnesota to St. Olaf College, which is a Lutheran school. Two of my kids went there and my grandkids. Sort of a tradition. I majored in chemistry. That was a long, long time ago. Chemistry was nothing compared to what it is now. I came back here to Portland and trained as a medical tech at Good Samaritan Hospital. We drew blood and did testing. And that's what I did until I got married. I thought I'd go to Chicago, but I had an aunt in Butte, Montana, 150 miles from the ranch. My aunt said, don't go to Chicago. You'll marry someone from Chicago, and you'll be stuck there. <laughs> so I came to Portland. I met my husband in the church we both went to. Then the war came and all the boys were gone. We continued correspondence during the war. He was in the South Pacific. Then, when he came home, we got married. My family is on a ranch in Montana. They are still there. He's from South Dakota. We are both Scandinavian and Lutheran. And we were married in the church that we met in in Portland. I have two children, a boy and a girl. The girl is Greg, and the boy's name is Eric. My daughter lives here in Portland. And my son lives in Seattle. My son is a doctor in Seattle. He's still very busy. He's the oldest. He goes to Europe and makes speeches. He's been involved with the medical school up in Seattle. My daughter worked for two big companies, like Hewitt Packard. I have five grandsons. My daughter, who lives here, her youngest is still in college. My daughter has two sons, and my son has three sons. My husband, he grew up on a farm in South Dakota. He went to business college one year, and after that, the government was building dams and things. He was a finance person, bookkeeping and things. So he worked all over the West. Wherever they were building a dam, in California and Washington and others, he got his education that way. We met in Portland when I was training for a lab technician and working at that. There were a lot of young people at our church, and then the war came. We got out of church Sunday morning, and they told us about Pearl Harbor. And the next day, the boys were gone. The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor and all the boys were gone. We really weren't dating. We all had group things together. He was gone all during the war in the South Pacific. Could have died. He could have been in the invasion of Europe, but he had appendicitis. So he ended up in the South Pacific. He spent a lot of time on the islands of the South Pacific. He was in Iwo Jima for 18 months. We wrote letters. 
been gone 2.5 years. He was in the Air Force, managed the airfield, and when the war was over, they had been there so long, they put everyone with that longevity in the bomb, this bomb bay of a bomber and flew them to San Francisco and had dinner that night at the top of Mark Hopkins. And then he called and said, Stop writing. Start waiting. <laughs> I met him downtown at the bus station, and he was pooped. It wasn't very romantic. <laughs> I lived with friends in an apartment managed by some people we knew. So when Palmer got in, he got to stay there. Then we spent some time together. Palmer said, I'll go back to South Dakota to see my folks, and I'll come back and we can get married. I thought I might lose him to some gal in South Dakota. These veterans were very popular. <laughs> and I said, no, I think we should get married here, where our friends are in a church, and then meet the family. So, we got married. And the manager of Sears Robot let us use his mountain cabin. Then we went to Spokane and ate Thanksgiving dinner with his buddies up there, and then got on the train to Montana, and he got to meet my family. By that time, the snow was ankle deep, and I had to buy food. His farm was not as modern as some of them, and I had to go bumping through that snow up to the toilet. They all took their baths in the tub in the kitchen, not at the same time. <laughs> I was the big city girl. So they carried my tub up one flight to the bedroom, and that's where I had my weekly bath. The tub was just a big wash tub, and they pumped water out of the well and then heated it on the stove. Most of the farm did have running water. My sister-in-law, Palmer's sister, had property in the Arizona desert with a trailer. He used to go down there and see her, and then when she died, nobody else wanted it. So it wasn't much of a place, but we paid the brothers for it. There was nobody around for a quarter or half a mile. Lots of houses there were made of adobe bricks. People built them. People got, got together out there and played bridge. We didn't do any of that. A lot of people go to Arizona and they live in apartments or condos, people out there. We would get together with six or eight cars and take a trip for a few days and then come back home. The very first night, I went to the door and there were about five or six desert pigs out there. They're big. I didn't know it at the time, but they're not dangerous. They wander in little flocks. We lived out there. And we had all these rabbits and birds and the flora and the cacti. It was just wonderful. We would go there in the winter. The trailer belonged to Palmer's sister. And nobody else wanted it when she died. It always had meaning, so we kept it. It had a bedroom and a bathroom and running water. <laughs> but you had to have your water tank filled from time to time. Some people had wells. There were, wonderful, there were wonderful experiences living out there in the desert. I suppose we went out there for 10 or 15 years. We lived out in the desert for several years, and then I guess we sold it and moved it to a condo near Tucson. That was after the kids were grown up. He wasn't even retired. We just took some time off and would go down there for two or three months. He worked for New York Life Insurance, but he had done a lot of other things. And that's what he did after we were married. As told by Marion Weston. I grew up in Chicago. It was a lot colder there. The wind and the cold come down in sheets. It's a lot milder here. I didn't like how cold it was. There was a lot of snow. I don't like snow, and the climate here is a lot more milder. I was a stenographer. I didn't work with the court. I worked in an office, and I had a boss. I had to write down a lot of shorthand that was in code. I thought to myself that it wasn't as important as it actually turned out to be. You had to write down what someone says and then read it back to them. It was like a secret code. It was really hard to understand, but this is really what you had to do. I think the secret was to put them in your memory and pull them out when you need them. My children, well, I wanted them to have a very special relationship for all the boys and for all the girls to get to know each other. 
I wanted them to know that they could talk to me about anything they wanted to. But sometimes they just said, what do you care? <laughs> I tried to be open-minded because my mother was very closed-minded. And she didn't let me and my sister do a lot of stuff. And I don't know why, we were nice girls, I think. <laughs> you know what? I think we're going to get away from here. We're going to circle around the whole place once or twice, maybe twice. And then we're going to go up and zoom right to heaven. I think I'll fly. As told by Marie Sanders. <laughs> My mom. It was her heart, I guess. She was in the one in Holgate. I went two to three times a week. I was still working. She had her own house. To this day, I don't know how we sold her house. I just don't remember it. I took care of my aunt and my mother-in-law, who didn't like me. I had to take care of her, too. He was gone, no other family. I had to make all the decisions. She never warmed up to me. When I visited, she would follow me, follow me down the hall, saying, don't go, don't go. I could only take so much of her talking. <laughs> the last month, she didn't make any sense. She didn't talk much about Kenneth. He was only 17 when he left home. Then the service, then me. It didn't seem to bother him that she wasn't nice to me. In one ear and out the other. My children didn't want to go over there either. She and her husband never showed any feelings for each other. It was just her way. If she had had more children, she may have felt differently. I don't remember a lot of that. I don't remember how my father-in-law died or selling the house. My mother had a different life than I had. She worked until almost the end. We didn't have much, and I thought my young years were happy. Gosh. When I got a bicycle from my dad, the only thing he ever did by me, it was a big thing to me. For Christmas, I may get a new bedspread, but golly, I was in heaven. And this sticks with me to this day. Homemade gifts and watching every penny. I grew up doing that. I have lots of friends. And they loved to come to my house, although it was an old shack. I think most of those girls are gone. I worked every Saturday. I don't remember what my kids did. They were with their dad. Of course, my son was in the scouts. He liked Boy Scouts. They had uniforms. Kenneth got involved in all of that stuff. Same thing with the Rosarians. He pitched right in. He was in charge of some of the big doings they had. People told me he did a marvelous job. He worked for the phone company for many years, almost 40. Kenneth built a one bedroom right across from my mother. We stayed until Suzanne was a year old or so. There was a cold storage room where we did all the washing. It wasn't locked. You know, nowadays, everything would be gone. We had an apricot and a cherry tree. We canned all that. We had an old Ringer washing machine. We hung our clothes out on the line. We lost them once. The clothes were out on the line, and someone took them. Times really have changed. Kenneth didn't do much in the kitchen, but he was good at a lot of other things. He didn't have but one other job 
at the phone company. He retired from them. I feel sorry for people with young children who are trying to raise them and work. Never thought I'd be a widow quite that young. It's a different world. My friend lost her husband a few weeks ago. He had Alzheimer's. She went every week. He didn't know her, but she went. I think what she had to go through was harder than what I went through. He wasn't sick that long, but her husband was sick a long time. She would consider not going, but she would go. She would feed him lunch. Anyway, it's awful for a wife to have to go through those illnesses. My husband knew us the day he died. He laughed with the nurses. He volunteered up there. That's why he knew all of them. We had been at the coast. He didn't feel well. He spent the weekend in bed. I don't know how he drove home from there. Monday around noon, I said, I am taking you to the hospital. And you wouldn't have known he was sick. He was in intensive care, and he still joked. Of course, he had a lot of visitors. I went to the bathroom, and the doctor met me. And I knew when I saw her, he was gone. He died while I was in the bathroom. As told by Doris Aker. She has a lot of hair here. This one was in San Diego. Every two years we took a ship to the islands. I saved money for it, a place for us to go. There was a beach and people there. When I was 19, I went to Italy to get my papers to travel to Canada. My family stayed in Egypt. In Egypt, you don't get married. You have fun. <laughs> and I had lots of fun. <laughs> it was beautiful. I took a boat from Italy. It was going to Argentina. And I stopped in Canada at the port. You get off the boat and then take a train to the city. <laughs> but I was stupid. My sister had paid, and then they told me, you have to pay. I went to Montreal. I spoke French. In Egypt, you have to speak French. Arabic, casually but French in stores. Oh, my father. He was imprisoned in a concentration camp. They knocked on the door, and an Englishman took him away at midnight. We had connections that used to come to us. Once you help them once, they know. When the war was finished, he was sick. He was in the camp for two years. I never saw him. I was in Victoria. Rough waters there. There's a picture in front of my room. My sister. She sent a telegram. He was dead. That was a new year. My sister was pregnant 
and she never even told me we had difficulties. My brother, he was in a concentration camp too, returned to Egypt, and then to Montreal, lots of Italians, he married. My brother is dead now. You know, Margaret was in a home. Toward the end, I went every day. I think she was glad to see me. I wasn't really grasping that she wanted me. Two women bathed her and told me with difficulty. I told them to forget it. I knew that she was dying. She was ready. My son and I, we would take her for a drive. It was a nice place with a garden fence. The second time, we took her to the hospital. The nurse said, she's going to die if you go. I said, okay, don't tell her. She was beyond. She was on all kinds of machines. I pulled the machine from her arm, and that was it. She never knew. I'm kind of old. Don't let me fool you. I'm over 80. I'm old. It's not what I thought it would be like. You just don't think about aging. I was 18. No, 22, the first time I came to Canada. It's the best time to live. I like to be out on the water. The Mediterranean, I learned to swim. And I remember summer, oh, the sand. My friends taught me and my sisters. That's all I remember. I didn't have to do chores. There were always friends around. The house was two houses, so there were friends in the back. As told by Ronaldo Chewbacca. born in Knoxville, Tennessee. My brother, his name was Francis Edward. That was his original name, but everyone always called him Bud or Buddy. When we were little, we were sent to a remote people in the family for a summer trip. We went to stay with the Hamiltons because our mother wanted us to get out in nature. But <laughs> we went down to a danger zone where there were fish and snakes he got real near to what they call the pump house. He would always see something in the water and sneak down there. He was always adventurous. <laughs> it was Aunt Inez that got him out. My mother had two sisters named Aunt Iva and Inez. And at the time, they were with us at the Hamilton. Boy, he sure got himself in a heck of a lot of trouble. At least he got out before he was bit. One of the best times I can remember was when we went up to my great Aunt Annie's and she took us to a big cafe. She was called Miss Annie and very well liked. She was one of the first to graduate as a stenographer. The man that was her boss at the time had great books with beautiful stories. She took us to this restaurant where we had to walk to, to get a bus to get downtown to treat us to a fancy restaurant to teach us manners. <laughs> it was during the Depression, and it was a great treat. I used to work at the shipyard doing key punch, which was an early version of computer data entry. I kept all the records. My husband, Tori, was helping my family, 
and he would give me rides home from the shipyard. Otherwise, I would have had a ride home on the bus in the dark. The first time I met him, he said, Who's that Cleopatra over there? <laughs> he was married. Oh! But when we met, and they got divorced, we all still remained friends. The three of us and Tex would go out to a little house in the forest, and we'd pick berries. Tori and I, we dated for about a year. The war was almost over, and he had a son from his first marriage named Michael. Tori was a very kind man. One time, he bought a trailer for a family member of mine who didn't have a home. He was always so kind and caring for my family, as told by Laura Wolfchoff. About Finland? Oh, yes. I've been to Finland three times. I was born there. It's a pretty little island way up north. Way north. Further than most can go. I came on into America from there, which is when I was from. Finland just goes on and on and on. It goes all the way to the coast. The people were buying land low on the coast because it goes so far. Swimming? Oh, yes. In the summertime, some places were warm. Finland is a very small state, but they were trying to get people to come closer to the coast because there was so much good land. I was born there, so I learned Finnish in Finland, and then came to America with my folks and lived in America ever since. You should know how to pronounce Finland. It's swollen. My family were farmers way back, so they, look, so they looked until they found land. In fact, my father looked at two states. My father was an expert. He loved to farm land. I went with him and our whole family to many places, and always because of the land. We went to Finland even when I lived in America. We took a farm in North Dakota, and so we took some land and raised cattle, and Dad was sure that was land that could be farmed, and he bought every kind of seed and started several little farms there. North Dakota is one of the middle states, but I really prefer the ocean. <laughs> Sophie, you know what that is? Kiss. As told by Simon Midland. Meals. We usually had 
a homemade bread, <laughs> mashed potatoes and gravy, spinach, and roast or chicken. Oh, and then we would have homemade pie. <laughs> I'm very fond of custard pie, but I wasn't too fond of apple pie. Breakfast is my favorite. And I would probably choose buckwheat pancakes with maple syrup if I had the option. <laughs> I guess my favorite lunch would probably be roast beef with green beans or spinach with butter rolling all over it. <laughs> and scallops or baked potatoes. Now for dinner, I like T-bone steak or round steak and rolls. <laughs> Moscow, Idaho had nice grocery stores, but we had very little food that came from something we hunt or caught, hunt, hunted for or caught. Depending on our age, Mom would take us to the grocery store, which I guess was about a half a mile away. My parents were slow at getting a car when I was growing up, and we had to walk wherever we wanted to go. My father's work was about a mile or two away, so he walked a lot. If I were to guess, it would have been about when I was in high school that my parents finally got a car. My dad was slow to learn how to drive, and I don't think my mother ever got a driver's license. When I was the appropriate age, I got a bicycle. My parents both met and grew up in Indiana. The relationship that they shared was a very loving one, and they got along very well. They were tender and loving in their behavior with each other, and they never fought. There was no great demonstrative loving of each other, but there was never any worries about their relationship with their kids. My parents were both raised in farm families and were knowledgeable about the process of having a house built. As a result, they built a house of their own called the Jefferson Street House right there in Moscow, and raised Joel, Greg, and I in it. We were not a rich family, but we were comfortable. There was not a lot of singing in our home, but there was a lot of musical opportunity, as my father often played musical instruments in the house. My mother was not a musician at all, but she was very supportive of my academic work growing up. I had music lessons most of my years, and I played the violin and the viola in high school and in the college orchestra. I had many instructors, and I cannot remember them all, but my main instructor was York Kilby, and there was Carl Close. I don't know the spelling. I still can play, but it's a great waste, and I'm ashamed that I do not play as much as I would like to now. It would add less to my life if I would just work at it and play a little more. My son is a musician and a composer, very modern composer. The first job that I ever had was Rushi Peas. The area around us had a very important pea center, and we had to work to grade the peas for their best quality. The other job that I remember was I was a paper boy. I delivered papers for the Spokesman Review. I think it was a small national paper. There was a building in town that I would have to go to pick the papers up from, and then I would take my bike and I would go deliver them. They had a daily edition along with a weekend edition. The paper was purchased one month at a time, and then I would have to collect the money from the individuals every month. The first pet we ever had was a goldfish with an adequate size tank. My brothers and I really wanted a family dog, but my father thought dogs were a lot of trouble, and it took us a while to convince him to get one. As for my education, I attended Moscow High School, and I loved to learn, thanks to my father's educational influence. During high school, I was a very good journalism student, and I took my turn as the editor of a high school paper called the Waxamonia. 
which is Moscow, spelled backwards. <laughs> I think my class was roughly about 100 students. After school, we would usually play in the yards of the houses on my street. In the backyard of the Jefferson Street house, which had a big boxwood elder tree that had a huge trunk that was growing at a 45 degree angle. And it was something that we were able to learn to safely play and climb on. We also had an apple tree that was a wonderful climbing tree. These were real assets for us. We had a safe and healthy neighborhood to romp and play around in. It was just a good, healthy place to grow up. The one apple tree we had grew a nice crop of apples every other year. We certainly got a lot of use out of those apples. They were good a variety. We would eat them, and my mom would can and bake them. At a very young age, my parents encouraged me to get involved in the scouting program. They didn't push me, but they encouraged me. I was not in any sense a great scout, and I do not remember any particular merit badges that I completed. But I was regularly involved there, and we were encouraged to learn life-saving skills. In my scout troop, there were about a dozen of us. I was not an Eagle Scout, but I think I completed the star rank. I did not wildly enjoy scouting, but I had a lot of fun with it. I think the program was good for me. It solidified my ability to have friends and make friends. I think I had plenty of good friends. I do not think I was handicapped about friends. One friend that comes to my mind is Barney. He lived about a block away, and I think that he became a neurosurgeon later on in life. Our family would frequently go on summer vacations, and we would visit Lake Lewis, Hayden Lake, and Twin Lakes. We didn't always camp at these places, and sometimes we would incur expenses in somebody else's enterprise. During these trips, I would fish some, but I wasn't very enthusiastic about the taste of fish. However, in the course of my adult life, I've got a little more sophisticated and more fond of fish. But all oh, fish never competed with steak or chicken. <laughs> I would not say that I was an enthusiastic camper either. I didn't mind it when it was with my family, my friends, and the scouting program. Along the trip to the lakes, our family took a train ride to Indiana to visit my grandparents, usually about every two years. We would stay with my maternal grandmother, Lydia. Her house was bigger than my own house growing up. It was a brick house, and a nice big porch in the front with rocking chairs. Then you would enter the front door, and there was a great big open room, and upstairs was a bedroom. The house was on a big lot there, plenty of room around it where I could play with my cousins. We had a lot of snow in Moscow, and enjoyed the sight of it, but we didn't like to have to shovel it. I'd much rather be inside studying. I got the privilege of attending school, and I got to see my father also at the college because he was a math professor there and head of the math department. In college, I was a member of the fraternity, Phi Gamma Delta. I don't remember much about it, but on the college campus, it was a well thought of fraternity, but numerically, it was not the most frequented fraternity. However, it wasn't the smallest one either. The fraternity was mostly a social experience as we would go to dances together and gather at the fraternity house for social events and dinners. After college, I went into public health and then I became a psychiatrist. I mostly had a private practice, but inevitably I was involved in collaboration with others. During an average day, I would see five to six patients. Most of my patients were adults, and I was interested in being useful and knowledgeable in a wide array of interests. Most of my enjoyment was with the older patients. 
I can't recall why, but I really enjoyed working with them. I just did. I met my wife, Bonnie, at college during our freshman and sophomore year. She caught my eye because she was interested in something that was unusual, and her responses in classes were very unique. I don't remember at this time the specifics of what we did in our courtship, but I remember we just spent time with each other and that was what really mattered. When we first got married, we were in St. Louis and lived in a small apartment. We were pretty lucky because we both had good family backing, neither of us from rich families, but we had great support from our families and life was not too hard. We never had to deal with depressing days. We had fairly good times. We have three children, Joel, Greg, and Megan. To show our love to each other, we would do what men and women usually do to show their love. <laughs> she loved me, I loved her, and that's what was important. She was a girl that loved me more than most of the girls I was crazy about. <laughs> we all found each other very interesting. After we got married, my wife painted, and these paintings are in my room. They're her adult works. I certainly like my wife, as dictated by Dr. Eugene Taylor. See that picture over there? My mother was crazy about royalty, and we bought that picture way back. I was 10 or 12 years old when we bought it. We went on a trip to Vancouver, and on returning, my mother saw this picture in a second-hand store when my dad was putting gasoline in the car. She bought it for $12. When we got home, it was all wrapped up in newspaper, and as my dad was unpacking the car, he said, in the name of God, what's in the package? <laughs> and my mother says, never you mind. And he says, I want to know what's in the package. So he said, she said, it was Queen Victoria. And he says, it's not hanging in our bedroom. <laughs> By golly, that's where it hung for the rest of their lives. <laughs> we had a lot of fun over it. I had it appraised. As I said, we spent $12 on it, and the appraiser said it was worth $1,400. She is not the handsomest of ladies, but that hung in their bedroom for the rest of their lives. My dad just did not like royalty, but my mother loved royalty. My husband and I, we had a lot of fun together, celebrating our birthdays together. He was three years older than me. We lived in the same neighborhood, and we had a lot of fun. There were only three girls on our block, and I was the only one that flirted. <laughs> we came out of the alley and flirted. There was only, uh, uh, when we talked about birthdays, I said, my birthday was on January 27th, and he said his own was too. I said, Oh, you big liar. You just said that because I did. <laughs> it turned out that he had five boys in his family, and one of his brothers happened to be there, and he said, no, that's his birthday. So there was no question about it. I didn't have to go ask his mother if that was his birthday. <laughs> anyway, we had a lot of fun. We lived in Tacoma, the Puget Sound area, and we went to the same high school. When the fleet and the sailors would come in, it was real fascinating. <laughs> I've been to Austria, Italy, England, Ireland, Scotland, and other countries outside the United States. I've been to different states in the country, because when my husband was in the army, we would go to different states. Some of the men in his outfits lived there, and we would have reunions. There was a lot of fun. We lived in Arizona for a long time during the war. Arizona is a real hot country. People tend to live and move to 
where they are comfortable living. I have two children, four grandchildren, and eight great-grandchildren. I'm so glad my granddaughter has so many children. She does homeschooling. When he was nine, he wanted to play the drums, and I said, Honey, why don't you play the violin? And he says, I don't want to play the violin. I want to play the drums. So that's what he enjoyed doing, and we helped him accomplish that. My husband and I took dance lessons in 1962. We joined in different dance clubs, and we danced. I can't tell you how much we danced, a lot. And we would go to the Crystal Ballroom and different places. We tried to have a lot of fun with our lives. We traveled also. Then, as we grew older, we would go to different cities of the people we knew while my husband was in the service. We would go to their cities, and that was a lot of fun. <laughs> an A student. Nursing school was the only way I knew how to get into the air. Stewardesses at that time had to be nurses. I went to school in southern Iowa. Our doctor at the time was an osteopathic physician, and he got me into school there. Going up to Hannibal, Missouri, I flew with Elmer. I was probably in my early 20s, after nursing school, I wasn't a very apt learner. I learned to fly before I learned how to drive a car. <sighs> the day I soloed, I think he was scared to death I was going to crack up his airplane. I'd get lost, then I'd follow the wrong thing back to the airport, but I always got back. <laughs> you said if you saw an airplane that looked familiar, you'd follow it back to the airport. You were supposed to have a compass, but I didn't know how to read a compass. <laughs> we had to learn to stall. You'd go up until you stalled, and then down again and level off. My boyfriend thought it was foolish for me to waste my time and money learning how to fly. So that was the end of that relationship. <laughs> no, I didn't have many boyfriends. I learned to fly before I learned how to drive a car. I just loved to fly. I didn't have anything else, but I had that airplane until I went to the Army. I went in the Army but they didn't let me fly. It didn't bother me. I went into the Army and did, just did what they said. That ended my flying career. New Guinea. Oh, it was hot. We didn't get very good food to eat. Lots of wounded and injured men. Being a nurse, you just take care of everybody. It doesn't bother you one way or another. We did send a lot of letters that said, we regret to inform you, your son was killed in action. War is no good. When I was young, we were poor. I had a paper route, earned 25 cents a week. That was a lot of money back then. I wasn't what you call popular, you know. As a kid, we sold vegetables. I am 98 years old, and I still sell vegetables. <laughs> We used to put vegetables in a little red wagon and go across the track to where the rich people lived and sell vegetables. We grew them. Kids in our generation, we worked at home. Kind of worked around the house, the farm. No animals, maybe a cat. The house, two bedrooms, five kids. We all slept in that one house. I slept with my sister, I think. It was white. The cat slept wherever he wanted. Mostly, I worked out in the garden. I used to wear my hair like Amelia Earhart. Now it's long. I don't have to cut it so often. I like to wear slacks, especially when you're a nurse crawling over patients. I 
haven't had a very exciting life a couple wars world war two and the korean war as told by truest richard i like to learn maybe i didn't get anything to say in five but I like to learn. I like music and German. I knew that my grandparents were from Germany, so I wanted to learn how to talk like they did. I think it's good for everyone to know a second language. It's very helpful. I always wanted my kids to learn a second language. Back then, I worked with makeups and creams and things. I would tell people, you have a nice complexion, and I think this will work well for you. And I could usually make a sale. <laughs> I was doing so good that this fella came in to get something for his mother. He asked for something, I can't remember what it was, and then he asked me, what do you do in the evening? I said, on Wednesdays my roommate and I go to a dance here. I did a lot of dancing back then. <laughs> it was around the Second World War when I was at Yosemite. They had a lot of extra things for me to do there, and I liked it because it made me feel important. Later on that night, we were at the dance. I danced with others, but some of them weren't very nice with their dips. But then, <laughs> someone walked up to me and asked politely, would you like to dance? I said, yes, yeah, certainly. He helped me get back to my chair safely. He went back to his place where his folks were staying, and he had a great big bicycle with big wheels. The next evening, my roommate and I went to go swimming. Bridal Veil Falls. The next day, he found me and my roommate out swimming. He said, hi there, what are you guys doing? I said, we're swimming. <laughs> he had his swim trunks on and poked his feet in, but he did not like it. It was cold and he wasn't used to it. So we got out, we dipped in a couple times, but then we got out. I had other dates and danced with other gentlemen, but it just wasn't the same. He said to me, when I come back, do you mind if I give you a buzz? My folks need to go back to their home and I need to go with them. When I come back on leave, can I see you? Soon, he said, I will be getting out of the service. I have enough points that I can get out soon. When I come back, will you marry me? <laughs> I was really surprised. I was glad. It sounds funny, but I knew I had fallen in love. I said, well, what time? <laughs> he said, it will be I'm sure. So I asked my pastor, and he said, I'll be with you. When he came off leave, he asked if I could get off early, and my boss said, definitely, dear, it's World War II. So I took a bus to get to him, and that's the first time I heard sentimental journey. Um, so his parents helped him buy his marriage suit, and my mother got me my wedding dress. She had good taste. I liked what she liked. And back then, you didn't wear white for a wedding dress. Well, it was still wartime, so I wore a dress that was ruffled at the waist. I think it was purple. I went to a pastor, and he said, well, we don't have weddings on Sundays, but you could have it on Saturday. So I told my husband, and he told all his friends. There were so many friends. It was really a celebration of the war being older, over and of us getting married. It was beautiful, it was. For our honeymoon, we stayed in a cabin, first time together. It was by a canal, but they called it a river. Our wedding was Saturday, so we could be there on Saturday. This was the first time we could really be together. So the next day, we got back to our room there. We drove his parents' car. Usually they didn't have newlyweds there on Sunday, so they really fussed over us. We were the only ones there. We took a boat down the canal, and they played music for us in the boat going down the canal. He took my hand, and he kissed me, and it was beautiful. Oh, as told by an anonymous teller. Oh. Hi, I'm Monica Weitzel with Metro East Community Media, and we're here today with Jana, who was a performer in a storytelling event at Rose Villa. Jana, how did you get involved in this project? I am actually a board member here at Rose Villa, and so at one of our meetings one morning, they came in and we're talking about the project, and 
I lately have a fascination with storytelling. And when I heard about the project, as much as I enjoy our meetings in the mornings and the PowerPoint slides we go through, it's really getting to know the residents that makes that excites me. And so when I had an opportunity to get involved, I thought, what better way to really get to know these folks than participate? It was a wonderful project, and I really enjoyed it. Um, just tell me quickly, what, what did you personally get out of this? Ooh, a lot, but I think mostly an understanding of a time before me. They're the women that I spoke with and interviewed, they had very different life experiences than I had. They lived through a war, their husbands were living far away, they didn't have video games, they didn't have cell phones, and we had interesting conversations just about people and relationships that I think get lost a little bit these days. So learning about a time that's just before what I experienced was really fascinating. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. You did a terrific job, and thanks for being part of it. Thank you. I'm here with Muriel, who is a resident here at Rose Villa and also one of the performers tonight, and you did a fabulous job tonight. Thank you. Very what was it like being up on the stage telling somebody else's story? How did that feel for you? Well, I felt it was a very easy approach to drama. <laughs> they had done all the work, and all I did was to read it and enjoy it. You did a great job, but you've been involved in some drama here at Rose Villa previously, haven't you? Uh, yes, I was part of a group that got a drama group going, a sort of a little study group. We read plays, and uh, if we find a good one-act play, we sometimes do it as a reader's theater in our lobby before our happy hour. Um, and it is a happy hour, isn't it? You, it really you have a good is. time here at Rose Villa. <laughs> it's quite a production, that happy hour. <laughs> so um, before I let you go, Muriel, um, what did you personally get out of this experience? Did you, did you learn anything from it? Well, I certainly learned a lot of facts about my friends' lives, and they are my friends because my husband is, has been in our care center for nearly five years now. And in the course of that time, I've gotten to know and to love a great many of these people. And it's exciting to hear about their lives. It is, isn't it? Thank you so much, Muriel. Hi, I'm here with Paula, and she was one of the performers tonight in the Storytelling Project. Did a fabulous job. It was very, very fun to watch. How did you get involved with this project? Actually, I think it's a testament to the modern uh modern abilities of Facebook and uh, one of the people who interns here is a good friend of mine and she posted on Facebook and said there's this really great project happening does anybody want to be a part of it and I thought I'm dramatic yeah. I could do that that's great are you a professional actor I'm not I don't have any theater background at all I'm just a dramatic personality so what did you take away from this experience besides the opportunity to be up on stage and perform personally did it affect you in any way it did I think um, it, it speaks to the concept that we all have stories to tell and we can all learn from each other and it's really important to let our voices be heard because you never know how that's going to affect somebody in, in their own perspective and how they might grow. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Paula. I'm here with Susan at Rose Villa and we just finished the storytelling project. Susan, you had several performances here tonight yeah. uh, and are you a professional actor? Well, I've done some shows and, and I'm mainly a singer. but. Oh. Um, <laughs> I could, tell, I could tell you had that presence that you seemed like you felt very comfortable on stage and had done this before. Yeah. So, and how did you get involved in this? Well, it's, it's, it's like, um, like um, Paula? Paula, thank you, <laughs> said, um, I saw it on Facebook, a friend of mine who was here tonight, which is cool. She posted it and by chance I saw it and I thought this would be cool and it was and, and so I signed up. I'm so glad I did it. What was your favorite part of this evening? Me, okay, two of the two of the three stories that I read, two of the people were here, and I got to meet them and talk to them, and then I got to um, talk with a number of other people that had their stories read, and I just love it. I just love it. It's pretty exciting to put the face with the the story, isn't it? It really is. It would just, um, and I just had so much fun. It was, it was fun meeting. The, the, the storytellers, it was great meeting the other people that read, and I really want, I want my mom to do this, and I, because I just think, what a nice record for the families, and, you know, just. It is, it is. I think it's a great idea for more and more people to do that, to record these wonderful kind of stories that we maybe never would have heard. I know, yeah. I really, I agree with you, so. Yeah. Thank you so much, Susan. Well, thank you. I'm so glad you guys came. And Cassie. Thanks. Here at, at uh, Rose Villa with Cassie. Cassie, what is your uh, title here at Rose Villa? 
I'm the activities and volunteer coordinator in our health center. And you do a fabulous job. And, and the residents and the rest of the staff think very highly of you. But this was a huge project to take on. Tell me a little bit about um, how it came about. I, I heard what Ellen said earlier, but what did you have to do to put this all together? Um, it was a lot of time really sitting down and fleshing out what it was that we really wanted to accomplish with this project. And I think our main goal was really to focus on hearing uh, the residents' words and finding out what was really important to them to share. Whether it was accurate or um, historically factual didn't really matter to us. Um, just making sure that they were being heard and including people from the community and being a part of that process. It was really, really fun. And I loved hearing like Dr. Taylor's stories about the food that he loved oh, and right. that kind of I thing. Yeah. What, uh, is there anything in particular that stood out for you in tonight's performance? Um, I just, I think it was just absolutely moving. Um, I, it brought me to tears several times and I've heard these stories and read them and, you know, been involved in this whole project. Um, I think it just really brought life to people's words and really just showed how important every single person in the community is. I agree with that. One last thing, the people that actually told their stories, how did this affect them? Can you give me a little insight in that? Yeah, you know, I, I think that it really allowed them the space and the opportunity opportunity to share what was most important to them. Um, and so many people um, in a long-term care setting don't get that opportunity and um, just really gave them the, the chance to share their memories and their stories. It was a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, Cassie. Thank you.